Ichiro Oda's One Piece is epic. Over the last 20 years, he's had us visit islands of sand, frost, dinosaurs, and even clouds in the sky. And it's that Sky Island, sky island. Sky island. that we're going to investigate today. How it came to be, how it exemplifies the engineering concept of shearing, and what to make sense of it from a mechanics point of view. But before getting started, spoiler alert for the first 300 chapters or 200 episodes of One Piece, and while we're at it, please subscribe to the channel. That said, I'll try to do a brief synopsis before getting started. I swear it'll only be a couple of chapters, so if you're already familiar with the story, please feel free to jump ahead using the timestamps. After Luffy and the Straw Hat Pirates wrap up their saga on Alabasta, they come to find that their required next destination seems to be in the sky. When they dock at the nearby island of Jaya, their mission to gather information for how to get to this fantasy location is met with derision, but they do learn of a man of similar fantasy named Cricket, who lives in a goofy house on the other side of Jaya. Upon meeting Cricket, we learn that he is the descendant of a folklore legend. And as the legend goes, this man named Nolan finds a civilization made of gold, goes back home to tell his king, and when he and the king's men return to the island, there is no gold or civilization to be found. Nolan is then executed for lying to the king, some classic Boy Cried Wolf-esque folklore. So this Cricket fellow is determined to clear his family name and find the island treasure that his ancestor assumed had sunk to the bottom of the ocean, Atlantis style. But his diving exploration is interrupted by the Straw Hats on their quest to find the their island in the sky. As it turns out, Cricket does know of a fantastical method that he thinks might get them there. If the crew can find and then ride the spontaneous vertical ocean current called the Knock Upstream up into the air at the precise moment these mysterious dark clouds appear overhead, he thinks they might find their destination. And it works. They make it to Sky Island. So the Straw Hat Pirates search the cloudy land for Nolan's lost gold and eventually come across this familiar looking abandoned house, or well, half of one. And it's at this moment they realize that at least part of the Sky Island they found wasn't always in the sky and must have once been one and the same with the island of Jaya, only to have been lifted into the sky by the knock upstream. It explains why Cricket has this weird house and why Nolan never found his golden city. And there's so much more to this amazing story. Oda gives us the background to Cricket's ancestor Nolan, his counterpart Kalgara, there's a huge golden bell, a snake god, but we're not here for a summary. Let's evaluate this tall tale with the engineering eye. To start our forensic analysis, we'll evaluate in three parts how the knock upstream cut off part of the island and carried it into the sky. So to tip my hand a bit, this is a channel describing the build environment, and our subject is an island. So while I'm most interested in reviewing how the story of Oda's Sky Island exemplifies the concept of a shear failure, we'll also be discussing geologic and dynamic sciences, at least at the third grade level that I can manage. So let's kick things off with a brief description of the knock upstream. Luckily, we don't have much to guess. Uh, Oda tells us the mechanics of the phenomenon, and I've been talking a lot, so I'll let Cricket explain. Deep below the ocean floor, there are large cavities filled with air. Cool seawater seeps into these air pockets and geothermal energy heats it until it becomes steam. Over time, the pressure builds, and when it finally becomes too great, there's a tremendous explosion. This explosion hurls the water into the air and creates a current. The phenomena looks most similar to the actions of the geysers like the ones in Yellowstone National Park, but on a much larger scale and with an ocean of water between the point of pressure release and the surface. The issue with the release that Cricket describes is that it would disperse energy in all directions rather than a directional flow, and so I find similarities in the knock upstream with the mid-century atomic bomb test, which while terrifying in scale, don't have the focus of the knock upstreams, and those energy releases were much closer to the surface than our phenomena. Although I've heard that Oda seemed to have taken this concept from a real environmental occurrence called a limnic eruption. The similarities seem to stop at gases trapped in rock. Their eruptions take a form of toxic levels of CO2 and raise the water levels a little bit, so Oda tosses in a whirlpool to throw us off the scent. Regardless of the comparisons, the point is we're going to assume there's a huge pressure applied to the underside of the island, so how can we guess the amount of force it would take to sever the island in half? First, let's take a diagrammatic approach, with this view representing a section cut through the island, with several layers of rock and sediment, and of course our ticking time bomb below. Now we can start by describing the exposed section of Jaya like a horizontal beam, and while most beams are typically only supported at each end, an island might be better described by a continuous support, by virtue of the fact that it is all one piece of hardened magma. But part of the assumption of the failure mode is that the island is a huge void beneath one end, creating a weakness around that surface that the Naka pressure exploits when it fractures the island, but now it seems that the two-dimensional view starts to lack. And adding in the third dimension, thinking about the island like a flat plate structure, like one of concrete, the failure isn't just linear, but along a perimeter that could approximate the circumference of the knockup void. And like a concrete or steel plate, the island can be sheared along the critical surface of least area. 
So then from this rough diagram and an assumption of some dimensions, we can start to assume what force it might actually take to remove this piece of island. And we can calculate the force as the sum of the height of a substrate material times the circumference of the removed portion of island at that section times the shear strength per square foot for each material, and then add the weight of the island above that since it would also need to be overcome. At this point, we'd have to make some serious guesses about the size of Skypea and the geology, so let's try and take a stab at it. For the width of the island, we can get a halfway decent estimate by assessing Luffy's three and a half hour trip to go beat up Bellamy in Mockdown, and using the maps provided, throwing some vague numbers at the board, we could probably assume the island diameter of about three to four miles, let's say 20,000 feet. The soil types and soil depths are total guesses, so maybe if we simplify the check by assuming a single material with a depth of 300 feet, the visual cues from the manga and anime might assume different, but who's to say? So that would make for about 18 million square feet of area on the island circumference that cuts through Cricket's house. And if I'm brave enough to assume that we're dealing with an igneous rock, which can have shear strengths of 600,000 pounds per square foot, then fracturing the island would require 12 trillion pounds of force. But then adding in the weight of the island, and there's another 15 trillion pounds to overcome. As an engineer who typically deals in thousands of pounds of force, maybe millions, the concept of trillion is truly mind-blowing. Now, obviously, we've made a lot of arbitrary choices in this analysis, so making different assumptions about Luffy's running speed or bug catching abilities can make a huge difference in the size of the island, but even my lower bound estimates would still peg the shearing force in the trillions of pounds. The final check we'll get into is about what happens after the island becomes dislodged and is absolutely rocketed up to the White White Sea at an elevation of 10,000 meters. And luckily, there are some relatively simple equations for dynamic movement that I'll use. Note that I'm not an aerospace engineer, so please tell me how wrong I am in the comments. No, I, I disagree with that. No, no, no. No. To launch something up to a given height, the required starting velocity needs to be the square root of the final height times twice the acceleration due to gravity. And for the island, this maths out to be about 1,000 miles per hour. But of course, it doesn't just start out at that speed. Before the knock upstream effect, the island is at rest, or a velocity of zero. And this change in velocity, or acceleration, is needed to calculate the force required to launch Sky Islands to the White White Sea. If we assume the dirt-covered rocket got up to speed within a second or two, the issue is that the force required would actually exceed the strength of even the incredibly strong island rock, in the same way that actual rocket ships gradually accelerate to exit velocity. So if we limit the maximum force to be equal to the compressive strength of the volcanic rock, which is about 4 million pounds per square foot, we'd need at least 18 seconds of acceleration time to gradually get up to the required speed that would let the island fly the rest of the way. Yet even with this reduced acceleration, the total force required to achieve this feat would be over one quadrillion pounds, and in the process, pushing the island about one third of the way up to the white white, before letting momentum do the rest. Yeah, so shearing the island really wasn't the hard part. In fact, from what I can tell, the energy release required to move the island to its final destination would be equal to 7,000 times the energy release of the strongest atomic bomb ever tested, or 12,000 wigwams, which is a much better sounding unit. Before moving on, I should also note that as mentioned, the shear check, I've assumed a lower bound estimate as well, which similarly puts us in the range of thousands of wigwams. So what does this all mean for Oda's story and Nolan's friends who reside on the island with the Golden City? Well, under an acceleration more than twice that of gravity, the Sky Island inhabitants would have been in for a hell of a ride. Three Gs of acceleration wouldn't typically be damaging to people as our bodies begin to reach their limits closer to 10 Gs, but I'd have to say I'd be impressed if the other half of Cricket's future house would have held up the same. Brick masonry construction isn't exactly known for performing well under high accelerations. Anyways, that's a wrap on this video. I hope you liked it at least half as much as Luffy enjoyed his trip up the knock-up stream. If you did, uh, please leave a like and a comment down below. And if you didn't, yeah, still, uh, leave a comment. Tell me what you thought that I got wrong about maybe the analysis. I know that parts of it were imprecise. Uh, with that, I, I guess I'll leave you uh, for the day. And uh, peace out. Adios.